The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, welcome. Coffee with Kalafi. Here we are, a beautiful fall day in the Ozark. I hope you're enjoying the same weather. Uh, today, Kevin's with us. Kevin Freed is our uh, product manager up in uh, Coffee, Milwaukee, and he's put together a great presentation. You're going to like this one on pressure reducing valves. Hopefully, everybody knows that Cluffy is offering pressure reducing valves now, so we wanted to give you the lowdown, how they work, the difference, and all that. So, there's a lot of great information in this uh, slide. So, um, latest issue uh, Hydronics number 21. You should have that by now. If you don't, let us know. Make sure that you're still on the list in that, but that was mailed out, and that um, we don't really have an Hydronics specific to the topic today. We just want to make you aware that. You know, we have them coming out and make sure that you're getting those and uh, let us know what you think of that and what else we can uh, um, use for topics. If you have anything in mind, we're always uh, anxious to hear that. I think, Kevin, if there isn't anything else. Um, I think that's that's about it. Thanks, Bob. Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, today's topics, let's go through those real quick so we know what we're going to talk about. Uh, first of all, what is a PRV? We will talk about how a direct acting PRV works and a pilot operated PRV. We'll discuss selecting the right PRV for your application, how to size it. We'll discuss in detail fall off pressure. That seems to be a topic that people are curious about. Another question that came in was in regards to domestic hot water expansion tanks. So we're going to talk about those when they're used with PRVs. We'll get into a little bit of math and, and look at head pressure and PRVs in multi-zone high rise applications. We'll talk about piping PRVs in parallel. Yes, you, you can do that, and we'll just discuss that. Also in series, so um, great topics. We'll talk about failures. What are the things to watch for? What are the concerns? And um, talk about maintenance, too. And lastly, we'll talk about the Kalefi 535 uh, PRV. Got, uh, got a lot of great features and benefits to cover there. So, and then stay till the end. Uh, we want to make sure that you're there so you can vote for the Kalefi Excellence winner near the end of the presentation. So those are the topics. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. First of all, I want to thank everybody for submitting your pre-webinar questions. We got a, a bunch of great questions that came in, and I, I hope I address most of your questions in this presentation. If not, though, be sure that uh, you know we will send you an email reply. And that, uh, that also is uh, applicable to any questions you send in while we're talking. You can see down below that you can put comments in. So I encourage you to do that, and we will respond to all of them. Let's take a look at this nice graphic that illustrates how the Great Lakes Water Authority uh, distribution system works. I like this because it shows a big picture all the way from supply uh, to the property owner. So, um, of course, here we have uh, the, the water intake. This is actually a lot like the, the facility just north of Milwaukee um, off of Lake Michigan. So we bring the water in. Uh, it goes through a water treatment plant, and perhaps they use uh, ozone or chlorine treatment of some sort and then send that water out uh, where we may or may not have a reservoir and a booster station in a system like this. Um, onto a master meter, and then the transmission line, of course, continues on down. Uh, at some point, uh, we, we come off the transmission line to distribution mains, and we're showing right here a PRV in that large pipe. And here's an image of a flanged PRV. This is actually a, a Kalefi product. And the PRV will reduce and stabilize that main supply water pressure to a usable level. So why do we need to do that? Well. Main supplies can be very high in pressure and too variable uh, for the end user or the customer. So that's, that's really the, the base purpose of the PRV. So as we come down the line here, we, we come over to water mains uh, where you'll see fire hydrants and service lines and curb stop valves, eventually to the property owner or the end user. So here's where we would find a PRV like the one I show here. Uh, there might or uh, may or may not be a water meter there, and there may or may not be a backflow preventer uh, at that location. So at that point, uh, let's take a closer look at that, that property owner or the service line end of things. Here's a schematic of uh, a typical domestic water system uh, for a, a residential customer. And you can see this first item here, this is a backflow preventer. And uh, we're not gonna get into too much detail here. That's a future coffee with Kalefi. But in this schematic, we come through a backflow preventer to the PRV and then on into the, the uh, customer's facility where of course that cold water 
uh, is, is piped up to the various fixtures. And uh, also it goes over to the domestic hot water supply, where in this schematic we're showing a, um, a relief valve on the tank and this hot water supply comes out. This, this graphic has a thermostatic mixing valve, of course, then that serves tempered water uh, out, out to the facility. Now, some homes like mine, I don't have a PRV because the municipal water supply is, is at the right pressure to serve the neighborhood where I live. Um, so you, you may or may not have, have one of those. Now, commercial application is the same, really just larger, more piping, uh, more building, more PRVs probably, especially if we're looking at multiple floors. So that's just really general. Uh, what we want to do now is shift gears and uh, let's look at how a PRV works. Okay, this is a basic graphic that shows um, that a PRV uses what's called a force balance principle. So the outlet pressure on the bottom of the diaphragm, this light blue area here, opposes the spring pressure on the top of the diaphragm uh, to control the position of what we call the poppet down here or the valve and the valve seat. Um, if the force on the top of the diaphragm is greater than the force underneath the diaphragm, this poppet will be open which allows more flow and more pressure. So the stem, in other words, is pushing downward. Um, and in this case, the uh, more pressure and more flow would be passing from the, the inlet of the valve to the outlet of the valve. Vice versa, if the force on the bottom is greater than on the top, then this poppet is pulled closed and the stem moves upward. So the pressure adjustment up here will increase and decrease this uh, upper force uh, on, on the top of the diaphragm. So when the outlet pressure uh, is equal to the force on the top of the diaphragm, then we have a stable condition here. If the outlet pressure drops, let's say that you have some fixtures that open and this outlet pressure decreases, what happens? Okay, this diaphragm will move down and open the poppet to bring more flow and pressure out. Does that make sense? All right, here are a couple of pictures. This is a one inch valve in a residential application. You can see this, looks like this was just recently put in. It's a lot newer than the existing piping. So this is a small PRV that probably has uh, an inlet of maybe 70 PSI from the supply and maybe a 45 PSI set point. A lot of valves come out of the box set at 45 for residential applications. Here's a larger one. This is a one and a quarter inch valve that's installed in a small commercial application. Um, and this one uh, is in a, a building in Milwaukee. And the inlet here, because the water pressure varies so much where we are, um, you need a PRV to stabilize and control that pressure. And this one happens to be set at 75 PSI, which is, which is a typical set point for a commercial building that has a lot of piping. Kevin, that's First picture is a classic example why you need a backflow preventer because you can see there's a hose pipe connection right next to that. And if there was a low pressure condition on the main, it's possible to, to suck water either from the landscaping connection there to the right or from that hose pipe. So hopefully that city protects it out at their meter pit or something. Yeah, obviously that's not up in the northern climates by the plant material there and being outside that's probably in Southern California or Florida. So this is a really neat picture uh, that we got from a Brazilian colleague. Um, you notice the, the uh, plastic pipe. According to our colleague in Brazil, these are parallel redundant PRVs. These are Calefi PRVs um, that are sold in, in South America. And in this case, for them, it was a requirement by code. So here you can see the isolation valves, uh, which are obviously a really good idea because uh, for redundant service, you need to be able to clean out these Y strainers. So this is great because they can just valve off uh, one line or the other, clean a strainer and uh, not have to shut down the system to, to keep moving. Another slide showing a direct acting PRV up here in the top, if you can see that, that's a direct acting PRV. And what we have going on here is the water is coming through a testable backflow preventer. Uh, you can see the, the discharge piping there uh, on through a water meter. So in this facility up in uh, British Columbia, they're measuring the water consumption um, probably for conservation purposes. And then the water comes up and there's the PRV. Now there's a bypass 
around the PRV. That's not uncommon. Actually, in some places, that's actually mandated by code. So we like this picture too. Uh, thanks to um, Rocky Point Engineering for that. Okay, what about a pilot operated PRV? Okay, I drew the pilot in red here and you can see a, a pilot operated PRV basically has a, a, a miniature PRV in between the inlet and the outlet of the valve. So there's a connection to the inlet uh, from this pilot, there's a connection to the top side of the diaphragm, and there's also a connection to the outlet. Um, its function is to provide additional control to the main part of a PRV, and what it does is it improves response time and accuracy. And these are typically used on larger valves because um, of the physical size and the internal components uh, of larger valves can be slower to react to downstream dynamic pressure changes. Um, so uh, typically they are larger valves, maybe two and a half inch on up and typically flanged. Um, whereas smaller size valves are pretty quick to respond because they have less area and so typically a pilot is not necessary. Here's a picture of a cleffy flanged um, cast iron pilot. Now look at this here. You can see this connect. Here's the uh, pilot, right? This connection is on this side of the PRV. Back here is the pipe that connects to the other side of the PRV. And this tube right here is the one I talked about that connects to the top side of the diaphragm. So this product is, is sold in Europe today. We don't currently offer this in the U.S., but I think it's a great example of a pilot. All right, let's talk about selecting the right PRV for your application. First and foremost, we need to make sure that we know the main supply pressure that the valve is going to be looking at. We need to make sure and select a valve that can easily handle that inlet supply pressure. We need to make sure we know the maximum and the minimum outlet pressure requirements. So this is the pressure that is going to supply the fixtures in the building, such as you know the toilets and showers, et cetera. So, on the outlet, we will have a maximum allowable pressure, and actually by code, uh, the UPC says 80 PSI is maximum. So that, that's um, going to be a governing uh, value. And also a minimum usable pressure. Wh what is that for? Okay, um, fixtures require a certain minimum pressure to function properly. So we need to make sure that the valve can deliver um, at least that minimum pressure out to the fixtures. Okay, flow rate. We need to know the maximum flow rate. And the way we do this is um, it's a fixture calculation procedure that I'm going to describe uh, in the next slide. And this is part of the design to determine uh, the maximum flow. And the minimum flow rate. Why do we need to know and, and pay attention to the minimum flow rate? Well, we don't need to, to uh, specify a valve that is, is too big. An oversized PRV uh, is going to be unstable if you're trying to operate it near the closed position, as with any control valve. Um, and if you try to operate uh, a valve near closed for too long, you, you'll see problems. Um, for example, premature uh, wear on the seat. And uh, Kalefi has, has a guideline here that we want to also uh, suggest a three to one ratio between inlet and outlet of, of a PRV. Now let's talk about that a little bit. This is a, a conservative guideline. So you don't wanna use one PRV to try and reduce from an extremely high pressure down to a low pressure. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, later in the slide, but this is an important factor when you're sizing your PRV because you do not wanna risk uh, seeing cavitation. Um, Cavitation is, is the formation of vapor bubbles, which will occur when a liquid is subjected to a rapid reduction in pressure. Um, a high flow rate through a small restriction will cause a, a severe pressure drop, enough, in fact, to cause that vapor formation, okay? And when, when the pressure recovers just downstream of the restriction, those bubbles will implode and can generate really intense shock waves and cause a lot of damage to the piping and the valve. And sometimes it can sound like gravel flowing through the pipe. Um, you know, definitely not a good thing. Here's a spec for the Kalefi 535, for example. So in our literature, you'll see that we have uh, the maximum pressure rating, the, the pressure setting 
range, the, the factory setting, which is just what the knob is set at when it comes out of the box, and um, a maximum working temperature of 180 Fahrenheit, which is a, a really nice um, high temperature rating. I'm going to get into some details later about hot water booster systems, and uh, that becomes important. Okay, um, regarding design flow rates, uh, designers will use tables such as this. Now, this is just an example of a table. This particular one, um, you, you can find tables like this in the in the UPC, the plumbing code, even in vendor literature, for example. And what this is, is, um, is showing different types of fixtures um, in either public or private applications. And what it has over here on the right are fixture units. Now, a fixture unit is not a flow rate, but it's a design factor that takes into account the likelihood that all of the fixtures in a given circuit are not going to be used at the same time. So uh, a good term for this is maximum probable demand. Uh, that's understandable. We understand what that means. And um, so what you do is uh, you, you look at which type of fixtures you have, how many, and what you do is you total up all of these numbers, um, you know, for example, five fixture units for one water closet that uses a flush tank. If you had 10 of those, that would be 50 total fixture units, for example. Now, what you, what you need to do with that is convert fixture units to GPM, right? So um, the one way to do that, this is a chart from the ASHRAE handbook. Um, I believe this one is called the, the modified hunter's curve method. And once you sum up your fixture units, say for example, you came up with 100 fixture units in the table we looked at just, just before. Um, what you could do is start from here, come up and reach the line that corresponds to the type of facility you're looking at, be it a hospital or a school or a restaurant, and then come across to the GPM and those, those values will represent your maximum probable demand that the PRV has to serve, okay? By the way, um, I'd invite any comments about this from any of you engineers out there. If you use certain approaches or practices or, or methods, we'd love to hear from you, okay? So once we know the flow rate demand, we need to select a PRV. So if you're selecting a Calafi PRV, we have this chart in our technical brochure. And because now we know the GPM, that's what's down here on, on, the, X, uh, on the X scale, okay? Um, this chart comes from our 535 brochure and the process to select the valve size once we have the GPM is really easy. And I wanna point out this blue band right here. Calefi recommends for sizing for your maximum probable demand to stay in the range of three to six feet per second. So this is the sweet spot for determining valve size based on your maximum probable demand. Let's take, for example, uh, if we had a requirement of eight GPM as a maximum product demand, or excuse me, maximum uh, demand for our water. Come up from eight GPM, you can see right here, the three quarter inch valve is perfect. Uh, that one's right in the middle of the blue band. So a three quarter inch valve would serve uh, 8 GPM, and you'd be looking at right around four feet per second uh, in velocity. So that'd be just right. Now you don't want to undersize a valve and, and have too much pressure drop if you're trying to deliver excessive GPMs, and, and you don't want to oversize a valve, as I mentioned earlier. One feet per second, one foot per second, is the recommended minimum flow in a Calefi 535H for stable control. So for example, this three quarter inch valve can easily control down to right around two GPM on up to, what's that, about uh, 12 and a half GPM at six feet per second. So this is the range of the valve for GPM. Now that we have the, the, uh, the uh, GPM and we've selected the valve, here's that eight GPM again, come up to our three quarter inch valve. This is graph number two, where we determine fall off pressure. 
Now, fall off pressure is for this app, for this particular example, right around maybe 7.1 psi. Okay, um, the fall off is really the pressure drop across a PRV at the design flow rate compared to the setting on the knob. Okay, and why is that important? What we need to do is make sure that the fall off pressure plus all the piping losses from the valve down to the fixtures does not reduce that supply pressure to a value that's less than the fixture is going to require for proper operation. So it's an important concept. And let's take that a little further and look at some actual lab data that, that came from our test lab here in Milwaukee. This line represents a test that we did on a three quarter inch Kalefi PRV with a 90 PSI supply and a set point on the knob of 75 PSI, which is pretty typical for a commercial application. So this particular test was, um, was emulating a commercial application. So we start at 75 right here, and the laws of fluid dynamics are, are saying that anytime there's flow through a restriction, you'll have a pressure loss. So you can see what happens here as we start to flow water through that valve, the pressure drops, and continues to drop. So the outlet pressure over here, um, say we start at 75 and assume we have one faucet running, okay? That's maybe a one and a half GPM faucet. What, what happens to the pressure of the valve? It starts at 75 and drops yeah, maybe to 73. So you can see there's a little bit of a pressure drop there. Two faucets, okay, so double that out to three GPM. Okay, the, the pressure falls a little more, and now we're maybe at 71 PSI. So that would be a fall off of four PSI. Still not, not really a problem. We're still probably going to be able to serve everything we need to uh, downstream of the valve. Okay, let's say we have three showers running and showers are 2.5 GPM each. Okay, where are we now? We're down to about 68 which is a fall off of seven PSI. So this is probably still going to be okay, but what, what we need to remember is it depends on the pressure losses and all that downstream piping and the flow and pressure requirements out of the fixtures. And um, also in looking at this graph, you can see we took it all the way out to probably about 48. Um, so eventually you get out here to a point where you've really dropped a lot and um, it's not unusual to see a 15 or a 20 PSI fall off pressure in a PRV application. So let's say if we had 20 here, we'd be at 55. And where would we be on the flow curve? So maybe about 21 GPM at a fall off of 20 PSI. Okay, and I hope, hope all that makes sense. So here's another graph of that same test. What we did is we took five different brands of PRVs and put them in, in the same test. You can see some of these valves after about five GPM or after we've dropped um, six or seven uh, PSI fall off, they really start to change and some of these fall off rather rapidly. So what does that mean? Okay, a valve with, with rapid fall off will deliver a lower pressure out of the fixtures than a valve would that has a better fall off performance. So let's switch gears again a little bit and let's look at a schematic and get a little better understanding of what this means when we're talking about a system. Okay, in a residential system, really fall off is, is not a significant issue. Why? Because it's a smaller system. You know, you may only have two or three levels and relatively short piping runs. Um, so let, let's take a look at this here for a minute. Here we're coming in with the supply. Um, again, a Y strainer, highly recommended, in some cases mandated. We go through the PRV, and in this particular schematic, we have a check valve. So again, we come out and serve the, the fixtures. And as we come over here to the hot water storage, uh, we wanna talk about this. We've had a question or two come in on expansion tanks. When do you need a domestic hot water expansion tank? Well. The uniform plumbing code says you need one unless the system is designed by a professional engineer. So I guess there are other ways around that uh, if, a, if a PE is designing the system. Um, two, if you have a hot water storage tank, uh, 
what you'll see is expanding and contracting water. And in some areas, if you have a hot water storage tank, um, the expansion tank is, is mandated. Now, you may not need one for an on-demand water heater. Why? Because you don't have a large volume of water to expand. So for example, if this was a 50 gallon storage tank full of cold water and you heated that up um, to supply temperature, you might be looking at 52 gallons of volume. So what does that do? It puts stress on, uh, on all the rest of the piping if you don't have an expansion tank. Also, um, if you have a backflow pressure, uh, a BFP installed in the system, the UPC says you have to have an expansion tank. So before the days when backflow preventers and check valves were really widely used and, and mandated by code in some places, some PRVs had a built-in bypass feature which would allow the water to actually return to the supply side. Um, generally, that's not acceptable today. Kevin, any idea if, I'm, if you're on a well system where you have obviously a pressure tank, and if it's required on that, I've never really seen an exception for that, but it wouldn't seem like you would need one on a, a system that has your you know, own private well, unless there's a check valve between the, the tank and the water heater somewhere. Yeah, great question. I, you know, I, I'm not sure of that answer, but if anybody out there knows that answer, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I don't know if, uh, if there's a code that addresses that. So any other comments about this one, Bob or Mark? Um, back on that question, I think uh, because you are uh, controlling pressure by way of your uh, pressure switch and your holding tank with an expandable diaphragm, uh, I can't imagine a, um, a typical situation where you would also need to have a pressure um, uh, uh, PRV. No, okay. Yeah, so as far as fall off pressure, we, we kind of led into this slide with fall off pressure for residential buildings, not really a, a major concern, okay? But it, it is a factor in commercial applications, okay? Here's a schematic that illustrates that. When we have multiple levels or multiple branches and long piping runs, um, fall off pressure is, is a significant part of the uh, design process, so very important, okay? All right, what we're gonna do now is um, talk about multi-story commercial buildings, but before we do, we need to understand uh, head pressure. So we're gonna do a little bit of math here. Stay with me on this, um, but let, let's start with the basics. If we have a vertical pipe containing one foot of water, the pressure at the bottom of that pipe is gonna be 0.433 PSI, okay? It doesn't matter if you have a one inch copper pipe with a foot of water in it, or if you have a, uh, a storage tank with one foot of water in it, because we're talking about one square inch at the bottom of that column. So one foot equals 0.433 PSI, all right? But what does that mean when we're talking about floors in a building? Let's take, for example, a five-story building that's 60 feet from floor one to floor five, for example. So 60 feet times 0.433 is 25 PSI. So we would have uh, static head pressure in that column of water of 25 PSI measured at the bottom. So that means if we have five floors, let's just assume that they're all the same and one floor is 12 feet, which equals five PSI. So where am I going with that? Okay, now remember we talked about minimum supply pressure for fixtures. We're going to select a number of 35. Let's say that the fixtures we have in this application all require a minimum of 35 PSI. And you'll see where I'm going with this in just a second. And remember, we talked about the UPC code saying that 80 PSI as a maximum for anywhere in the system to protect the fixtures, okay? So if we're pumping from the bottom, or if we're pumping, or if we have a PRV down on floor one, we need to have uh, at least 35 PSI up at the top at the end of the line. So as we work our way down the column, remember five PSI per floor, right? So we've got 40, 45, 50, and 55 PSI. So this is where static head pressure uh, comes, comes into you know, consideration when you're talking about multi-level buildings. What if we have a 30 floor building? All right, let's say that uh, we're still pumping from the bottom. Now in talking to a, a couple of plumbing engineers, and again, if anybody else has a comment, 
please send it in, um, that it's pretty common to have every five floors a PRV. I've heard that from a couple of different sources. So I'm going to use that in this example. And um, now maybe maybe more, maybe less. It depends on the piping. There are a lot of variables involved, but, but let's go with that for, for, for now. We talked about 35 PSI minimum, 80 PSI max. Okay, so let's start at the top since we're feeding from the bottom. What are we going to have on floor 26? 55 PSI, right? 35, 40, 45, 50, 55. It adds up as we come down. 60 on floor 25, 80 on floor 21, okay? On down the line. This is building up static head pressure all the way down through that column of water. And what do we have at the bottom? 180 PSI. Now this is just static pressure that we're looking at here. All right, anything jumping out at you here? If we had to supply that water from floor one, that pump or that PRV would have to be producing 180 PSI to lift that water all the way up to the 30th floor and have 35 PSI. But remember, 80 PSI max in any group of circuits. So starting from the top, if you come down, look what we've got at floor 20, it's a problem, and floor 16. So what we have to do is put a PRV there. So we're going to change that 105 PSI down to 80, for example, 80. It might, might not be 80, you might set it at 75. Okay, on down the line, we have to put a PRV here to change 130 and reduce that down to 80. 155 down on floor six, we've got to put a PRV there, and we have to have a PRV down at the bottom. Okay. Now, this is just one example. I want to make sure that we're clear here that you can put PRVs on every floor. Um, you can use multiple booster pumps. There are a number of ways to do this. What we're trying to do here is just discuss the principles um, behind using PRVs and how they relate to static head pressure. So, yeah, you can source it from the top also. Um, here's a picture of a couple of water uh, tanks in New York City up on the roof. There are actually tens of thousands of these in New York City, which is really cool. Um, and they're still widely used. So the principle here is sourcing from the top. The same principles apply, right? We still have that static head pressure build up uh, from floor 30 down to floor one. And for hot water as well, of course, you know, it's the same principles, right? Uh, now, one thing to watch out for with, with hot water is if you're looking at a project like this that's 30 floors and you have hot water, you need to make sure that those PRVs are designed for the hot water temperatures that you're going to be producing in that building. For example, the, uh, the Kalefi 535H is rated uh, for 180 degrees Fahrenheit with NSF 61. So NSF 61 has three levels. They have cold, uh, domestic hot and commercial hot. And our valve is rated for that commercial hot temperature, so 180. Not all valves are, so just wanted to, to make sure that um, you know that. Okay, PRVs in parallel. This is a great question that came in. Yes, PRVs are often, and uh, it's, it's very, uh, very common to see PRVs in parallel in commercial applications. So why do we need to do that? Why not just put a single large valve in that will meet the high flow demands? Let's take an example here. Say we have a requirement in a, in a group of fixtures that needs to be from 3 GPM to 30 GPM, okay? Looking at a three quarter inch valve, this is our 535. If you remember, I, I mentioned that the range on that is from 2.1 GPM to 12 and a half GPM. So one foot per second to six feet per second. Um, that'll handle the low end, right? That valve will handle the 3 GPM perfectly, but it can't get up to 30. So our inch and a quarter valve with a 5.3 to 34 GPM range, that can handle the high end. But remember, we talked about using a single large valve controlling at very low flows, that's not advisable. So what do you do? You pipe them in parallel. And uh, here's a picture. Again, I'm showing the isolation valves because that's just best practice, right? Um, so what we do in this case is we set uh, the small valve to our required set point. Let's just say, for example, 
uh, we want our supply pressure to be 70 psi where this valve is located. All right, so what happens here is that that small valve will handle flow from 3 GPM, right, on up to about 12 and a half GPM. Uh, so what happens, if you remember fall off pressure, when the flow through that three quarter inch valve reaches a certain point and we have sufficient fall off pressure, for example, 10 PSI. So if that small valve was looking at a fall off pressure of 10, then you set the big valve to 60. And what happens is then they sequence and that large valve will open once that fall off or downstream pressure reaches 60. Here's a great picture of a, a prefabricated. This one happens to be a pilot operated large valve, okay, and a direct acting smaller valve. And you can see there how that's piped in. So it's a nice shot um, that we took at a local hospital. What about PRVs in series? We, we mentioned that too. Uh, yes, it's very, very common to pipe them in series, series for two-stage pressure reduction. Uh, so when do we need to do this? Well, if the amount of pressure reduction is, is too much for just one valve, then we need to put two valves in series. Um, now, uh, guidelines again. Uh, Kalefi says two to one is ideal. You, you shouldn't have any problems reducing from a two to, you know, a two to one ratio from uh, inlet to outlet. And we have a sort of a soft guideline of saying, okay, up to three to one is fine. You may or may not be able to go higher than that, maybe even up to four to one. But the, the, uh, the consideration is when you get up into those high ratios, you're looking at possible cavitation and noise and erosion. So just, just beware of that. For example, if you do this, if you, if you try to reduce 200 PSI to 45 PSI, no matter whose valve you have, you're probably going to be looking at problems. And we've heard uh, recordings of valves literally screaming. I mean, it's a really high pitch, um, you know, break glass kind of pitch. Uh, you, don't, you don't want that. So what you do is put two in series, just like this picture. Bring 200 down to 100, and then bring that down to whatever, 45, for example. Let's look at PRV failures or, or problems. Okay, the number one, that according to what we see, is dirt, um, dirt and clogging. This is an actual valve that came back, uh, one of our valves that came back from an installation in the northeast part of the states. Um, and the complaint was that it wasn't holding pressure. It was allowing the downstream pressure to creep up. So we got this valve back and we opened it up and lo and behold, um, the, the screen is full of nasty dirt. Um, this is a real problem. Um, the screen caught most of it, obviously, but look look at the seat inside of here. You can see there are deposits around the seat. Now, this is where the valve seals. So because there are little particulates and impurities down here, sure, that pressure is going to leak through there. Um, so so dirt is a, is a major factor. That's why you want to put isolation valves in, have a regular maintenance program for any kind of PRV that, that you have. Two, high velocity. Mark, did you have something? Oh, I was going to make a comment, and uh, and that is that I think all pressure reducing valve manufacturers will offer some sort of screen uh, screen in their uh, PRV to protect against just what you are showing there, and on, and so some uh, some of the plumbers will practice uh, redundancy and include some type of straining device upstream from the PRV to give that double layer of having a chance of, of catching the debris before it has a chance to get into the seat. Yeah, yeah that's right. And it, even in um, some codes, Mark, I've seen that if the valve is smaller than an inch and a half, you have to have um, a pre-filter. So depends on your, your, your um, region and the codes in your area, of course. Now, velocity. High velocity is a problem. We've touched on that a little bit. If you have too much velocity, too much pressure reduction in a valve, what you have is, again, the possibility of noise, erosion, vibration, um, and, and that's, that's also a problem. 
Kevin, can I say one more thing too on those screens? As yeah. the screen plugs up like that, obviously you're going to get less flow through that valve. So you think your valve maybe is undersized and you get a lot of uh, pressure drop, but it could in fact be at the valve, not the um, the sizing of the valve, because that strainer obviously just like a Y strainer when it's 75% plugged, you've got uh, quite a bit of pressure drop through it. So it's that's yeah. why on even with isolation valves on both sides of the valve. So this is a this is a maintenance item on any system that um, you need to be able to get in there and and clean that out from time to time so isolation on both sides is, is wise. In, right. fact, it, in fact Bob what you'll find sometimes with this uh, debris situation is because the debris will get caught in that seat what you'll see in your building is when there's no demand a slow increase in your system pressure and uh, and you would think that uh, a higher pressure in your system would lead to higher flow but when as soon as there's a demand because of that clogging you get less, uh, you get more fall off and therefore less flow at your fixtures. So you, you're seeing high pressure on your system side, but when there's a demand, low flow. And that's a common um, symptom of you have a debris situation. Yep. All right. And what we did um, is we cleaned this screen, we cleaned that seat, put it in the lab and tested just fine. So nothing wrong with the valve. It was just dirty. It had plenty of life. Um, diaphragm failure. Now, this is another um, problem that you'll see out there. Uh, it's, it's a catastrophic failure of the PRV. And I think mostly this would be a result of chemicals in the water, maybe chloramines and uh, the wrong kind of EPDM or the type of rubber diaphragm that just, just failed due to, um, just, just due to becoming weak. Um, in a pilot operated PRV, the block pilot is the major concern. Remember, we talked about that pilot. It has small pipes, uh, small cavities. It's a, it's a mini PRV. And the larger the PRV, the more maintenance you have. And on a pilot-operated one, almost all the problems are coming in, in the, uh, the area of the pilot getting clogged up. Now, another point, too, um, regarding um, causes of failures. It's very important to have hammer arresters installed in the system at locations that have solenoid operations like dishwashers what that uh, if you don't have that you can get um, your hammer which uh, you know is hard on the diaphragm it just just exercises the diaphragm more than necessary it could reduce the life so uh, hammer arresters or surge arresters now so in summary um, you know a good inspection uh, regular maintenance program uh, is highly recommended and uh, y yes uh, PRVs you don't want one to fail um, because you're going to have significant downtime. So redundancy, like that picture in Brazil, or um, you know, isolation valves, like Bob mentioned, are important. So right now, what I want to do is throw out a poll question. We want to hear from you on what you see as the main causes for PRV, either uh, replacement or failures. Uh, you know, is it is it mostly related to noise? Um, pressure creep, you know, it won't hold set point like that dirty one we looked at. Um, dirt and debris damage or clogged uh, or scaled up problems or mechanical failure like the failure of the diaphragm. Or maybe the wrong valve was just installed initially. You know, maybe you go to a site and the valve is just grossly oversized and, and you have to replace it. So let's go ahead and do a poll. Yeah, and if somebody has some other failure that you see that's not on our list, by all means, send that in. We're just trying to get a handle on what uh, what we can make sure that we cover for you and uh, address any uh, issues that we can. Yeah, I mean, I'm watching. It's still going up until Woody ends it, but by far the uh, dirt debris damage clogged is, is you know, 61%. <laughs> the next closest number is 13. It's still going a little bit, but by the numbers are moving up consistently, and it looks like coming down the home stretch, it looks like it's going to be dirt debris damage and clogged by a nose. No, by a long way. Yeah, so we got 63% of the dirt debris damaged clogged. And the next closest would be a pressure creep on hold set point, which we suspected too. And then 7-9% uh, on the others for uh, wrong valve, noise, or failure. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Yeah, yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks for that. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about our valve, the 535H series. Um, this, is a, this has been a hugely successful valve for us. It's been on the market for a little over a year and uh, sales are going great. So um, what we wanna talk about are some of the, the significant features that differentiate this valve from the rest. And I think the pre-adjustment knob is one of those. You can see it in this picture here. 
it's adjustable from 15 to 90 PSI. Uh, you can tighten down the screw on the top and lock it in place to minimize tinkering. And you see that little set point window? There's one on the back also. So if you mount it this way or the other way, you'll always have a view to the setting on the knob. Our valve has unions on both sides, dual unions, half inch to two inch, and uh, they're available in sweat, NPT, press, and PEX. And uh, press and PEX, we're still finishing up a couple of the tail pieces. So um, there are one or two sizes that don't have the PEX crimp yet, but in general, we've got a great selection of tail pieces. Um, we can get it with or without the gauge. You see that pressure gauge there? That is screwed into a one eighth inch NPT female uh, connection on the body. So if you have a building automation system and you want to be able to monitor all of your pressures from your BAS, just get the PRV without the gauge and screw in an eighth inch pressure transmitter or pressure transducer there. That's a great place to pick up all your pressures. We have a very high uh, inlet pressure rating, 300 PSI. Uh, we meet all the codes and standards that you need. Um, of course, ASSC 1003, that's the performance. The NSF 372 is low lead, the CSA for Canada, and as I mentioned, the NSF 61 for cold water uh, and up to the 180 degree rating for commercial hot water. So also it meets the plumbing codes for North America, International Plumbing Code, IRC, and the UPC as well. So um, there's that number again, that 180 Fahrenheit for hot water booster systems. Another really cool, important uh, feature is the completely removable cartridge. You can see in that diagram that the whole thing comes out and you can clean the screen, uh, clean it out, put it back in without having to um, remove the valve body from the pipe really a convenient feature Think about, about that, that too, Kevin, if you look at it like there's a classic example if you look at the other brand i'll go to the next picture that you're going to there you can see to service all pretty much all the other brands i've ever worked on you got to take out like six or eight of those um uh, bolts to be able to get into the diaphragm and services some of them they used to have screws on there and the screws <laughs> the slot would strip out when you tried to get them out if they're in there for a long period of time so ours uh, just a simple uh, large crescent or a channel locks and you can get right into there and the screen is inside the cartridge on ours where the other brands you can't quite see in that picture but there's a separate opening which a lot of people don't realize that separate cap on the bottom of that is where uh, the strainer is kind of hidden in there so when you take the cartridge out of ours you'll have the access to the screen which is much bigger diameter also and um, you know you can get more parties and get them back together without uh, yeah, good points. If you remember that picture with all the dirt, that was a screen that goes 360 degrees around the port of the valve. So um, it's it's a very uh, good, high quality stainless steel screen. So this picture pretty much illustrates the difference between setting the Kalefi valve and setting um, the other brand of valve. Okay, it's a pretty stark comparison. Let's talk about the precision engineering. So inside the, the um, the heart and soul of the valve is the pressure balanced cartridge. Uh, because it's pressure balanced, it provides extremely accurate and stable control. Um, in this cutaway here, uh, you can see also the uh, peroxide cured EPDM. That's number one up on, up on top there. And the moving parts inside are made of low friction anti-scale materials. This um, um, PPSG40, that's a, a polyphenylene sulfide, which is a rigid opaque thermoplastic and it has really exceptional heat and chemical resistance and it's becoming a pretty popular material. Uh, PSU is a polysulfone which is a very expensive actually and a rigid amorphous material that, that uh, has a uh, low moisture absorption. So those parts fight scale uh, because they're very slippery. I can have a yeah. brag too about that, that um, why we do the peroxide curing on that EPDM. What does that do? Because I know a lot of others are just standard uh, EPDM, but the peroxide cure does. Yeah, that's uh, that's for chloramines. A lot of water is, is, is um, treated with chloramines and peroxide cured EPDM uh, is the best, uh, the best material to use to fight against chloramines. So down below in the performance area, the flow chamber um, is where we get the, the high performance, uh, the minimum pressure drop, the minimum drop off, right, fall off, and high flow. And uh, you can see this number five here in the in the diagram. This this piece right here is actually a, um, it's a restraint that goes around the stem 
and it holds the stem very rigidly so uh, that prevents vibration and harmonics and noise. And um, the 360 degree flow path, as we saw in that, that picture with all the dirt, um, really gives us our, our high flow characteristic and it prevents wire draw. Because we have a 360 degree flow path, um, we don't have you know just one single small opening which could um, could experience wire draw. And what that is is this high velocity water flowing through a small opening made of brass, and it can actually um, erode the brass and, and carve a little tiny seat in the brass, um, which would cause then leak through, and you have to replace the seat in the valve. So that's what wire draw is. I like this picture. This cutaway is in our new cell sheet for the 535. Uh, it points out some of the internal components and um, just, just a nice overall diagram to show off the valve. And I also want to point out here that um, all the literature that you need as a, as a contractor, as a design engineer, um, as a distributor, whatever your, your trade, um, we have guide specs that you can use to um, spec the valve. The tech brochure has all the technical information in it. The instruction sheet for installation, you know, everything you see here, the sell sheet for sales, the submittal data for you folks doing submittals. Um, if anybody's using Visio out there, we have stencils for that. And uh, we also have, I don't list here, but um, BIM object models, the 3D and 2D um, models for this product for those of you who are using BIM object, okay, or excuse me, that um, for using BIM uh, models. Um, See what else? Anything about the literature, Bob? That pretty much sums that up, right? No, I think you hit yeah. it. Yeah, and we've got some videos. I did a, a a quick video a couple of weeks ago. You might be able to find that if you go to um, the uh, 535H website. You'll see a video and a um, little two-minute uh, me talking about the features and benefits of the valve. You're welcome. Okay, okay that's all we had. So, um, Mark. Uh, do we have any comments or questions we want to tee up? And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, hang around if you want to. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you next time. In an installation where there is a need for high flow and low flow, uh, you had a schematic there that showed an example where the pressure setting on each of the two uh, valves was uh, different by 10 PSI. Is that a um, golden rule or a, a rule of thumb? Well, I've seen 10 PSI in uh, at least one article that I've read, and um, the technical information from Italy actually says 8 to 10. So um, basically, that's that's what I've, I'm seeing out there. So if anybody has any other thoughts on that, please send that in. But, uh, you know, when you're talking about fall off, too, it really, really depends. You, if you look at your fall off curve, maybe you want it, uh, maybe you want that big valve to come in sooner. So maybe a 5 PSI difference. And then when your small valve reaches a, a fall off point of 5 PSI, the big valve kicks in. So I don't, I don't know that there's any uh, hard and fast rule, but uh, those are the guidelines or suggestions. Very good. Another question um, was made reference in terms of pressure in the building. Some fixtures will have a pressure requirement to either stay above or below. Um, can you give an example of uh, such type fixture? Uh, there are some tables, and I, I um, don't have it right on the tip of my tongue, that you can look at that have suggested pressures for fixtures. It may be in the plumbing code, and I've seen like for, for sinks and lavatories, it's like 8 PSI. For certain types of toilets, it's uh, 25, and then those super powerful uh, high-performance toilets require like 45 PSI to operate. So it depends on the fixture, and I think also in the fixture specifications themselves, you can find the minimum pressure uh, for proper performance. Oh, yeah. Speaking of toilets, I think we had an issue in our own uh, bathroom here in Milwaukee uh, on pressure, right? We did, yeah. When, when our PRV is set above uh, 75 PSI, our urinals don't work very well. They, they leak. So we had to go out and tweak our, our PRV down a little bit to, to make sure we were, we were below, um, <laughs> below that pressure. And that took care I of the problem. I think that's fairly 
common on ball cocks and toilets and stuff too. If the pressure gets up too high, they'll start to squeal when they try to shut up at the very high end. So yeah. I thought that the pressure uh, that the plumbing code once upon a time said a 45 psi is a suggested, but I can't find that anymore. I don't know if I if that was true or not because I, I don't know why. But every one that I've ever used comes out of the box. It says preset at 45, and we do also. So I don't know what that number is derived from, but uh, certainly yeah. they can be set up to 60 if you have you know small pipe in your house or something need a little bit more. Well, 45 is, is the highest rating I've seen on a fixture, and that's those high-performance toilets I was talking about. I've never seen a fixture that has anything higher than that, so maybe that's why. Okay. Another question came in. I think you showed a, a rooftop hot water heater uh, in, a, in a high building and showing pressure-reducing valves. The um, question is, um, for plumbing hot water research, uh, would you would you want to steer around the pressure reducing valve uh, at each of your circuits, or do you go through the pressure reducing valve with your hot uh, water recirculation uh, flow? You're going to be going through the PRV, so that 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 valve becomes part of your uh, head loss calculations for that pumping circuit. Yeah. So okay. so you, yeah, the, the 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 PRV is just another valve in in the circuit. So you do have to account for that pressure loss at the GPM. Um, that your recirc pump is going to be uh, circulating water at. So, you know, for, for GPM, for example, you'd want to look at the pressure drop across that valve at 4 GPM and count that in your head loss calculations. Okay, that's pretty simple. What is a typical um, uh, range of pressures uh, you typically see in a household or even a light commercial application? Maybe, Bob, you might even have a weight on that. Well, it depends. I know I worked in a, in a mountain town, Park City, Utah, and what would happen there is they were developing that uh, that resort around there. They would put the water towers up on the top of the mountain, and so you'd have well, almost a 3,000 foot elevation from the uh, from the you know main street at the bottom there to the top of the tower. So there would be PRV stations every couple what a couple hundred feet, I guess. I don't know what the exact dimension would be where they'd have to put them in, and and we knew when one of those would fail out in the street, they usually had them on the vault out in the street because we'd have uh, water heater relief valves and fire sprinkler pressure relief valves popping off in a certain area of town, and we knew uh, right away to call the city that one of their big PRV stations had uh, well, probably got dirt or debris in or something in it and was creeping up and causing a high pressure condition, but. Um, you know, most of the time, you know, in that area anyways, and where I live in Springfield, it's not unusual to see 100, 125 pounds out at the city main. Again, it depends on where you are in, in relation to the either the boost station or the, the water tower. If you're right under a water tower that's a couple hundred feet tall, obviously you're going to have that, that high pressure. But, um, yeah, I would say it's all over the map. I don't know that, the, you know, a designer of water, public water systems, has a certain number that they try and stay under as far as their laterals and and the branches off that main come through town or not, but um, that's where those big PRV stations are typically located. Okay. <clears throat> Another question came in, um, and this is in regards to minimum flow rating of a valve. <clears throat> so are there any operational or performance issues with flow conditions below the valve minimum recommended flow? How does the valve respond? For example, a single fixture uh, calling for a, a half gallon per minute. When you have flow that's below the rated minimum of a valve, I th you're looking at some instability or potential hunting. The valve may not uh, control uh, at a very precise and stable level. It may uh, increase and decrease and, and hunt a little bit. Now, that's not always such a bad thing. I mean, if you have periodic flow that's really low and the valve um, is a little bit unstable, that's not the end of the world. You just want to not you know, make that a, a constant thing because then the valve is, of course, is not going to be working properly. And again, you'll be looking at very low flow and control near the seat, which you want to avoid. We've, we've talked about that, but, uh, you know, typically, periodically, not a problem. Uh, so, is, is, the, Kevin, is it, do you know if it's, on. is it, and if you, under those conditions, is it a condition that you would typically notice at the tap or wherever your fixture is where you got, you just cracked open a, a faucet for just uh, washing your or brushing your teeth, or is it more of an issue that's going to be unnoticeable except for at the valve seat, where over time you could get some accelerated wear? You won't notice it if you're any distance at all, really, from the PRV. If you were right at the, you know, the PRV uh, in a very short piping run, uh, you might notice that. But if you're downstream any significant distance, you're not going to notice. Okay, <clears throat> great. That was a good question. 
All right. Um, I think um, that might exhaust the questions. Um, on, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate you tuning in. And again, um, if you typed in a question, we will answer it. So um, thanks for attending, and we'll see you next month.